Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is George Perkovich. I'm a vice president for studies here at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And I want to thank you for joining us uh, for this important afternoon and uh, the opportunity to hear the remarks uh, from the foreign minister of Turkey. He will be uh, talking about absolutely vital issues today of uh, the Middle East, Turkey's relationship uh, with NATO, the Iranian uh, nuclear negotiations, all super important uh, issues uh, in the United States, in Europe, Middle East, and with global implications. We are honored to have uh, Foreign Minister uh, um, Chavusholu uh, here uh, in from Ankara. Uh, he will be making his remarks as we uh, spoke, and then uh, we'll be. I'll ask him the question. Yeah. Okay. And then we'll uh, be taking uh, questions and uh, offering a discussion uh, before he has to depart. As we mentioned, there's no challenge of difficult issues uh, confronting Turkey, uh, its allies, and other states uh, in the region. Uh, he will be addressing those. Um, one of them that, that we've worked on uh, here at Carnegie uh, in particular is the uh, challenge posed by Iran's nuclear program and the diplomatic effort to uh, deal with that. Uh, and we've just uh, published a book here uh, with a colleague, uh, uh, Sinan Ulgan and I, uh, and so it's available out, outside uh, if anyone is interested on Turkey's nuclear future uh, looking forward. Uh, but as I say, the minister will speak and uh, cover a whole range of these issues, and then uh, we'll have a discussion from, uh, uh, from thereafter. Um, minister um, Chavsholu is uh, minister since uh, the last uh, two years, but previously uh, he was the Minister of uh, European Union Affairs and also is a, uh, one of the founding leaders of the JK party in, um, in, in Turkey. So with no further ado, Mr. Minister, please. Thank you so much for the introduction. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure to be here with you all today. Let me thank Ambassador Burns in his absence and the Carnegie Endowment uh, for the uh, wonderful uh, reception. I'm here in Washington, D.C. on an invitation from my uh, good friend, uh, Secretary uh, Kerry. I will also uh, meet with uh, counterparts uh, from the administration and have uh, contacts uh, on the Hill. Of course, I value all those meetings that I'm going to have during my stay, but I'm equally uh, pleased to address you at this uh, century-old uh, institution. Over the years, Carnegie Endowment turned into a truly global think tank. It has contributed to the international peace through creative ideas and strategic uh, thinking. I am sure uh, you know the famous quote, every great dream begins with a, a dreamer. The institution has been home uh, to the many uh, dreamers uh, of the uh, peace. That is why I am very happy to have an opportunity to talk uh, to you under this roof uh, about the state of play in Middle East and uh, Turkey's uh, role. And this is a, a topic on which there has been much debate uh, here in uh, this town. And I know that not all the comments have been uh, positive. So I appreciate the opportunity to speak about our dream, our vision of new and different Middle East, one that arises on peace, stability, and uh, cooperation. Ladies and gentlemen, today the Middle East is largely in a state of turmoil. But the same Middle East uh, has contributed greatly to the philosophical, cultural, and uh, scientific uh, progress of uh, humankind throughout uh, history. President Obama himself highlighted some of these contributions in his uh, historic uh, Cairo uh, speech. And we believe that this region still has the potential uh, to create uh, great things. So then the question is, how do we turn this potential into concrete uh, achievements? 
after decades of oppression uh, and wars, we witnessed the Arab Spring. The people-led transformation process started to shake the foundations, very foundations of the uh, century-old uh, status quo uh, in, the, uh, in the region. In this process, we played a very uh, positive and supportive role as Turkey. We extended around $3 billion of financial assistance as well as political and technical uh, expertise uh, to the Egypt, Tunisia, Libya, and Yemen. We also contributed to the efforts of the European Union as well as the Council of Europe, Venice uh, Commission uh, in all these uh, countries. But the transformation process is currently characterized by a massive uh, challenge. Let me identify some of them and also share my views uh, for dealing with all these uh, challenges. The conflict in Syria affects Turkey the most. The situation has become more complicated with the emergence of Daesh or ISIL, you say here in the United States. In other words, the situation in Syria has become a serious national security uh, concern uh, for my country, uh, Turkey. We have provided significant contributions to the international coalition uh, as an active uh, member. We have mobilized our military and other uh, resources in its uh, support. So we agree uh, on the existence of a major uh, threat in our immediate uh, neighborhood. But we also say that the selective approach focusing just uh, on fighting terrorism will not uh, remedy uh, the situation in uh, Syria and in, even in uh, Iraq. The political vacuum in Syria has to be filled with a representative government based on the legitimate aspirations of the Syrian uh, people. This is the only way to bring a, a sort of stability in uh, Syria. The Geneva Declaration clearly identifies the necessary roadmap for achieving uh, this kind of uh, political uh, solution. The parties for any negotiations to uh, end the conflict uh, are clear. These are the Syrian National Coalition and the regime. The coalition is recognized by 114 countries and 13 international organizations as the legitimate uh, opposition. However, after Geneva uh, two negotiations, the regime thinks that it has a free hand to continue its violence against the people. This has to stop. The international community must exert pressure on the regime that, uh, so that it will uh, sit down uh, at the uh, negotiation uh, table. We have been working closely with the United States uh, to find a way to move forward for a political uh, solution in Syria. Our efforts on implementing training and EQ program is a clear uh, testimony. This program aims to create areas inside Syria that are safe. It will also provide a foothold for Syrians uh, willing to fight uh, Daesh. Ladies and gentlemen, Iraq has been in continuous crisis for many years. Daesh is the latest episode in the drama and maybe the most uh, complicated one. The terrorist organization has occupied more than one third of Iraq, which is equal to the size of uh, Croatia uh, in a short time. This was surprising for many, but we had been warning about this uh, possibility uh, for a long time. Why was Iraq faced with such a crisis? What is the reason behind? Simply because of the sectarian and oppressive policies of the previous uh, government after the departure of uh, American uh, troops. So there is a need for a policy that reaches uh, reach out to oppressed people and the regime uh, and should regain uh, their trust and the uh, confidence, I mean the current administration. And new Iraqi government under Abadi started well and gained international support. And Turkey has been also fully support this new inclusive uh, Abadi uh, government in Iraq. But it is again our duty to remind the Iraqi government that it needs to do more for winning the others of the uh, country. Uh, promises must turn into concrete actions without uh, further uh, delay. In Iraq, in a short term, the, there might be some uh, military successes, but lack of confidence between the people and the government 
is unfortunately uh, continuing. Military successes will not be enough. There is a need for political and humanitarian steps taken uh, at the uh, same time. Tikrit and the other uh, liberated uh, cities should be held and run by the locals. People shouldn't feel that they, uh, they have come under another uh, term of uh, oppression in Iraq. Iraq cannot be governed uh, as before uh, Daesh. It should evolve into the, uh, a functioning uh, federal uh, state. This is not something new, uh, obviously. It was also uh, foreseen uh, in the Iraqi uh, constitution. We know and we now uh, uh, and know the task at uh, hand uh, is not easy. And uh, we shouldn't uh, put undue pressure on the new uh, government. But unfortunately, the, the urgency is all too uh, evident. That is why we are providing political, military, and humanitarian support uh, to Iraq. And we are carrying out a training uh, acute program for the Kurdish regional uh, government, KRG and Mosul National Guard units. We have already trained uh, more than 1,600 uh, Peshmergas in uh, KRG. And on the humanitarian side, we are hosting nearly 2 million uh, people from uh, Syria and Iraq uh, combined. Our expenditure has reached almost $6 billion, uh, whereas we receive only $300 million uh, worth support from the international uh, community. We are also doing our part uh, to stop the flow of uh, foreign uh, terrorist uh, fighters. We have taken all the necessary measures. We have set up a no-entry list, which now involves uh, more than uh, 12,800 people, and we have captured and deported around 1,300 uh, people uh, in this context. And, uh, and about half of them, we didn't have any information uh, from the uh, source countries, thanks to the sensitive work of our uh, security uh, and also uh, intelligence uh, and we have captured and uh, deported uh, them to the uh, source countries, and we uh, inform all those uh, source countries of these foreign fighters. But this is not an e uh, issue that we can, uh, Turkey can uh, solve uh, on uh, its own. We, we need improved information sharing and more international cooperation, particularly from the uh, source uh, countries. And the source countries should also start asking themselves uh, the hardest question. Who is really the weakest link uh, in this uh, chain? In addition to Syria and Iraq, we see sectarianism as a general threat uh, to the region uh, in the Middle East. There is a standard message that we give to all actors uh, and parties. Sectarian-based policies create no win situation. All lose in sectarian struggles, including first and foremost, uh, those who uh, favor uh, these uh, policies. Yemen is the most recent example uh, pointing at such dangers. In both Yemen and Libya, uh, what we need is political dialogue, meaningful political dialogue. We need political solutions based on the national compromise and consensus in both those two countries. Ladies and gentlemen, as a cornerstone of peace and stability, the Middle East, uh, in the Middle East, Egypt is another potential risk uh, for the region. Egypt is an important country for the Muslim world. Egypt is important for the Middle East, and Egypt is a very uh, crucial country for not only uh, Northern Africa, but the whole, for the whole continent. Egyptian uh, leadership pushes those people uh, they see as opposition underground and towards uh, radicalism. Our concern is that if the current trend is uh, left unchecked, a new and more violent social outburst in Egypt will be inevitable. Egypt's deep and structural problems can only be solved in a liberal and uh, efficient uh, political uh, environment. Therefore, we encourage all parties to advocate the establishment of an inclusive political system in uh, Egypt too. Ladies and gentlemen, 
of course, one cannot speak about the Middle East without touching uh, upon the uh, Palestinian uh, issue because it remains uh, the uh, core challenge uh, in the region. And actually, we all know uh, parameters of the solution. A state of Israel living uh, side by side with an independent and sovereign state of Palestine uh, on 1967 uh, borders with East Jerusalem as its uh, capital. Yet despite the best and most sincere efforts of my dear friend, uh, Secretary Kerry, the two-state solution is in a coma. You all know the recent Palestinian initiative uh, regarding a UN uh, Security Council resolution uh, to initiate a peace uh, conference. Such a, a resolution would make the Israeli side sit down for serious negotiations uh, for a two-state uh, solution. Unfortunately, this initiative, like others uh, trying to open the way to peace, failed at the United Nations uh, Security Council. The main body responsible for protecting international peace and security once again proved uh, incapable uh, of performing uh, its uh, task. Dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, yes, the general picture in the Middle East is not very promising. But there are also reasons for being hopeful and to be optimistic as well. Look at the political process in Tunisia. This country shows us that a legitimate political solution is possible to the problems faced by the countries in transition. The Tunisian people deserve uh, our full support and solidarity. We are also very pleased with the uh, political understanding reached between the P5 uh, plus one and Iran in Lausanne. We always advocated diplomacy as the only possible option for a solution uh, to the issue of Iran's nuclear uh, program. That is why we hope that the ongoing negotiations result in a comprehensive agreement by the end of June uh, this year. As always, we are ready uh, to offer our active support uh, to the uh, process. We also hope that the, uh, a final and a satisfactory solution to the nuclear issue uh, might uh, motivate our uh, Iranian uh, neighbors and uh, brothers uh, to facilitate the resolution of other regional uh, problems. In short, our approach in the Middle East is based on finding comprehensive, political, and inclusive uh, solutions. So let me put what we imagine uh, uh, into a picture. A secure and stable Middle East where the energy and trade routes interconnected East Mediterranean resources to all directions, a region which no longer makes the headlines with death tolls, but rather with uh, cooperation projects and success stories. Turkey is doing its part to invest in a common future in the region. We are putting a lot of efforts in increasing and uh, liberalizing trade, lifting visas, expanding uh, investments in the region. On the humanitarian side, being the third largest donor in, in humanitarian aid in the world, we continue uh, to extend our uh, helping hand uh, throughout the uh, region. We are trying to ease the pains not only in Syria, but also in Iraq and Palestine. In Iraq, uh, we are among the first to come to the help by sending 750 trucks containing food kits, tents, bedding, blankets, medicines, and medical uh, equipment. Our official humanitarian assistance to Gaza only last year is more than uh, $19 million. And we will continue to work for a better future for everyone uh, in the Middle East. Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, I know our topic is Middle East. But speaking as the Turkish foreign minister in Washington, I will not be doing my job in full if I don't mention two other issues two issues which have created mistrust and con uh, confrontation in our region for a long time. First, Cyprus. We have a window of opportunity to find a political settlement uh, to a problem that has been with us for uh, 50, uh, more than 50 years. And we believe 2015 uh, will be an important year for the settlement of the uh, Cyprus issue. 
our commitment for a solution is as strong as ever. We expect the negotiations to resume uh, very soon after the elections in the north. And the Turkish side is ready to go to the extra mile to make a lasting settlement possible before the end of uh, this year. But ultimately, it takes two uh, to tango. And what is needed for a settlement is true political will. If Greek Cypriot side and the Greece show a similarly strong political will, there is no reason why a settlement cannot be reached uh, by the end of uh, this year. As always, uh, the active involvement of the U.S. will be important uh, in the uh, critical uh, period ahead. Second, uh, the Turkish-Armenian relations. We have been working since 2009 to overcome the division between these two ancient uh, peoples, two people uh, who for centuries coexisted in peace and harmony. Let me underline this point. Turkey shares the suffering of Armenians. We try with patience and uh, resolve uh, to do establishment, uh, to establish empathy uh, between uh, two uh, peoples. We continue to believe that we can build a peaceful uh, common future only through uh, dialogue. In this context, our president's message last year on the events of 1915 was a, a historic uh, step. The recent stat statement of our Prime Minister in January, I mean, uh, was another uh, step forward representing our uh, humane uh, perspective. And a couple of hours ago, Prime Minister Davutoglu extended his condolences uh, to the Ottoman Armenians uh, who lost their lives under the uh, tragic uh, circumstances of World War I. And he also announced that in parallel to the remembrance uh, ceremonies around the world, a ceremony uh, will also be held at Armenian uh, Patriarchy uh, in Istanbul on 24th of April. This is uh, another uh, step of uh, historic uh, significance. And we will continue on this path. And we will continue to work for a framework that both addresses the historic aspects of the problem and also uh, helps solve the Nagorno-Karabakh uh, uh, issue. Dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, geography is destiny. And today we uh, stand at the crossroads uh, for the region. We in Turkey believe uh, in the promise uh, of our region and its peoples. We are willing and able to stand up uh, to the existing challenges. And so is the United States. The history of Turkish-American relations is full of success stories we wrote by working together. Our past achievements in Afghanistan, in the Balkans, and elsewhere is testimony to what we can do uh, together in the future. That is what gives me the confidence to say that Turkey and the United States will continue to work as uh, close uh, partners. Because uh, by working together, we have a better chance of creating a bright future we imagine uh, for the Middle East. Thank you very much. Can I answer the questions, yeah. um, if you don't mind? Yes, please. He's going to stay here, Ed, so it'll be yeah. okay. Um, for technical reasons, it's better. No, it's much better for the vision. Okay. So, uh, so I want to thank the foreign minister for those, uh, for those remarks. Um, we're, uh, we're going to uh, we're going to take uh, questions, and we will do it in the normal way that we do things here, which is to raise your hand. Uh, I'll call on several questioners. Uh, we'll take several questions together. The foreign minister uh, has been kind enough to, uh, to stay to address those questions. Um, please, again, there will be many people who want to ask questions, so um, make your question very brief and also in the form of a question, uh, please. And also, please introduce yourself uh, before before you start. So let's start uh, with these three right, right here in this row, and then uh, Michael. Uh, Barbara, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, George. Uh, Barbara Slavin from the Atlantic Council, and I'll monitor.com. 
Uh, Mr. Minister, um, how do you square your views with those of the Saudis, particularly when it comes to an issue like Yemen? Uh, your uh, your uh, Prime Minister was recently in Iran. You've called for a political solution there. Uh, but you are also, I believe, supporting the Saudi effort, uh, which is now bombing the country with no apparent result. So um, how, do you, how do you bring people to the table here? And if I may also ask a question, another question. Is Turkey um, taking a position on the direct supply of weapons to the Kurds in Iraq? Thanks. Kurds in where? In Iraq. In Iraq. Yeah. Hold that question for one second, and then uh, pass it here. And I'll come, we'll start with you, Michael, after the next. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, go ahead, um, uh, Michael Gordon, New York Times. Um, on a different subject, sir, uh, you mentioned the uh, uh, negotiations with Iran. Um, uh, the details aren't known, but the, the basic principles are known. It will extend breakout time to a year for a period of 10 years, but breakout time will shrink after that. No facilities will be closed, and Iran will be allowed to do research and development on centrifuges. Um, what is uh, Turkey's position on this agreement since the main elements are known? And are there any circumstances in which Turkey would feel that it should pursue uh, the development of nuclear technology on its own as a precaution against an Iranian breakout? What would those circumstances be? Thank you. Okay. Well, unfortunately, the situation is uh, Yemen is a uh, concern for all of us. And Houthis uh, took the control of the whole country. And uh, democratically elected president had to leave the country uh, due to the security uh, concerns. Of course, uh, due to the invitation of the legitimate uh, president, uh, Saudi Arabia led uh, GCC countries had the operation. And this operation became legitimate. And in principle, we supported this uh, operation. And we uh, announced that we can, if they need, we can uh, support, we can give them a logistic support and uh, intelligence as well. But so far, we haven't received any demand from the uh, Saudi Arabia-led uh, coalition. But at the end, uh, Turkey is for political solution and immediate ceasefire. And humanitarian aid, we are very sensitive in that and uh, broad-based uh, political dialogue, meaningful political dialogue, and possibly uh, national unity uh, administration or government in Yemen. That is what we need, and uh, that is uh, Turkey's position. And uh, I was with Erdogan in uh, Tehran, and he was very straight with our uh, Iranian uh, counterparts, that what Iran is doing, their sectarian policies, ambitious uh, in the region, is not helpful and not helping their interests either. So uh, we were very uh, clear with Iran, but uh, we can, Iran should be all, also involved uh, in the process, in, the, uh, in this process that I mentioned in Yemen. They should also use their influence on Houthis that they should withdraw and there should be uh, ceasefire and uh, uh, meaningful dialogue, and so on. And regarding the, uh, uh, the basic principle, the current achievement between P5 plus 1 and Iran, we are fully supporting this process, and we are fully supporting the achievements. And we, haven't underestimate, we shouldn't uh, underestimate the achievements made in this process. And we also spent a lot of efforts together with uh, Brazil in 2010, and it was not easy to convince Iran. Iran is our uh, brotherly country, our neighbor, but it is not always easy to make deal with Iran. We haven't even changed the gas agreement that <laughs> Turkey signed long years ago, and uh, hopefully we can find a solution to that as well. But uh, we are fully supporting this process, and we are against uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, in our neighborhood, not only Ira in Iran, but we are against nuclear weapons. And Turkey has no intention to have a nuclear weapon. We didn't, and we will not have nuclear weapons, sir. Thank you.
Yes, I'm, I'm Tom Deval here at the Carnegie Endowment. Uh, Minister, thank you for your remarks. I'm going to ask you an Armenian question without mentioning the word genocide, apart from, from just now. Um, um, you already did. <laughs> I already did, yes. Um, but um, you yourself today and also the Prime Minister and the President have gone much further than Turkish officials in the past in acknowledging the suffering of the Armenians. But as you yourself would know, the situation on the ground is still very bad. The border is closed. Um, and to give you know, one other example, um, the very few working churches, Armenian churches in Turkey, many churches still in ruins. I wonder if you can share any concrete steps that your government um, will and can take um, to advance reconciliation with the Armenians. Thank you. Well, first of all, regarding the uh, Armenians living in Turkey, we have uh, around 40,000 Armenian citizens. I think there are two candidates as well from different parties. One of them is from uh, my party. They are enjoying all the rights. And they are also enjoying the rights that uh, the Turkish government and state has been giving back. I mean, this, this is uh, not uh, something, not that we uh, give it for free, but it's, it, it, it was their rights taken uh, in the past in Turkey. But uh, it's not only them that all the religious minorities have been enjoying all the rights. We have been giving their properties back. We have been renovating the church, chapels, and synagogues. We just inaugurated a grand synagogue in Edirne uh, recently, and Turkey restored that. And we restored uh, Armenian church in Akhtamar Island in Lake One. And uh, uh, Armenians uh, get together every year uh, for worship in that uh, church. And we need to do more, and we are supporting the patriarch as well. Uh, patriarchy in uh, Istanbul, based in Istanbul, and also Armenian uh, foundations. And our citizens, plus another roughly 40,000 uh, Armenian uh, migrants also enjoying living in Turkey. We know that they had to leave uh, Armenia because of unemployment and poor economy. And uh, they are uh, irregular migrants. I don't like to use the word illegal, as the former president of the Parliamentary Assembly of Council of Europe, they are not illegal people, but they are irregular migrants. We tolerate that uh, they stay in Turkey. And regarding the uh, Turkey-Armenian uh, issue and reconciliation, we are for reconciliation. And uh, we have been spending uh, a lot of efforts, uh, particularly uh, since uh, 2009. Of course, this year, uh, Armenia and Armenian uh, diaspora uh, focus uh, to influence the uh, world public opinion on the events of uh, 1915. So we are not <laughs> expecting any positive response from uh, our uh, Armenian uh, friends, but we uh, understood that we have to look forward and we need to uh, overcome all these issues. And, uh, the statements of President Erdogan and, and the President, Prime Minister Davutoglu's two statements are a kind of turning point in Turkey as well. So we, are, we have been taking uh, courageous steps uh, towards reconciliation. I hope uh, the Armenia and our Armenian friends also understand that we need uh, reconciliation. And we, should con we, should, we will not give up as Turkey, and we should continue to uh, spend efforts towards reconciliation. Thanks, George. Uh, I'm Mahir Zenol from Turkey's Today Saman Daily. Um, Mr. Prime Minister, I'm wondering if you remember um, last year Did your you government... Did you call me Prime Minister? Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Prime Minister. Uh, I was wondering if you remember last year your government kicked me and my family out of, out of the Turkey because I tweeted a single report on, uh, on Twitter. And also uh, your government has recently arrested journalist Hidayat Karaja and Mehmet Baran. So how do you reconcile these incidents with the democracy and uh, the media freedom in Turkey? Thank you. Hi, thank you. Uh, I don't have a question, but my name is Abdul Halim Rajal. I'm originally from Somalia. I'm a Somali American, and I thank uh, Mr. Uh, Foreign Minister and welcoming him here. The success for Turkey, uh, everyone knows it's Somalia. So thank you for your government, for your people, and Mr. Erdogan, who went to uh, Mogadishu in 2011. During uh, that time, no one was going to Mogadishu. Today, Mogadishu and Somalia 
it stands where we are because of that uh, leadership and uh, the vision that uh, Mr. Erdogan showed. Uh, I went on the Somali, um, uh, the Turkish um, Istanbul conference on Somalia, and at that time I met with uh, Mr. Erdogan when he was the prime minister. And I promised him at the time, I say to him, I don't know what to uh, give you as a gift uh, because you know it was very quick. So today I have a gift here, I will give it to the embassy. It's, is, is a book, it's not any book, it's the Quran. The, our book, uh, uh, you know, is the defined word of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is where Daesh al-Shabaab is the same book that's read by uh, one point something billion Muslims that has been hijacked by uh, a, a bunch of criminals. So thank you very much, and uh, I will give it to the embassy. Thank you. Should I? Yeah, go ahead with the question. And then go to the back. Well, uh, media freedom is uh, uh, crucial for democratic uh, societies. And as a former uh, president of the Parliamentary Assembly, which is the home of uh, rule of law, and democracy, and uh, fundamental rights, and I am uh, fully for uh, free media and uh, freedom of uh, expression. However, in democratic societies and countries, nobody is uh, immune uh, from uh, persecutions because of his or her uh, profession. And regarding the journalists in Turkey, the latest committee uh, to protect journalists, uh, uh, CPJ, reported uh, seven uh, journalists uh, imprisoned uh, in, in Turkey. And when you look at the list, uh, none of them are persecuted for their uh, journalistic work. And as a matter of fact, five of them charged with serious crimes such as homicide, causing injury with weapons, bank robbery, forgery, throwing Molotov cocktails uh, to uh, the security uh, officers. And two of uh, these uh, journalists have been uh, released. And we see the similar cases in, uh, in other democratic countries as well. For instance, following the news of the world phone hacking uh, scandal in the UK, uh, the news editor of the said newspaper, Ian Edmondson, was sentenced to eight months. And Andy Colson, editor uh, of the News World World, was also sentenced to 18 uh, months in jail for uh, conspiring to hack phones uh, in 2014. And there are also other similar cases I have to give here uh, in Italy, Greece, as well as uh, this country, United States. For instance, Francesco uh, Gangemi, the 79-year-old editor of the monthly magazine uh, to uh, uh, Dibattito, uh, uh, the, it means debate, uh, and Alessandro uh, Salusti, editor-in-chief of the Milan-based daily, are prison for charge of as uh, libel, uh, perjury, and criminal uh, defamation. Let me give you another example. There is also another example in Greece, but since it is our good neighbor, I don't want to give this example. <laughs> another example from this country. Uh, Barack Brown, as a, uh, he is a uh, US journalist, and he has been sentenced to 63 months of imprisonment in January 2015 for involvement in activities of uh, activist group called uh, Anonymous. So uh, for me, even one journalist in prison because of his, his or her journalistic work is unacceptable. So is uh, for Turkey. Uh, therefore, uh, Turkey cannot tolerate any uh, parallel structure, particularly opistai uh, structures in the, uh, in the state st structures. And no democratic country can tolerate this either. Thank you. Two gentlemen in the back that are close by each other. Look this way also. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Tyler Thompson. I'm with United for uh, Syria. Uh, I was hoping that you could um, expand on, we, we've been hearing that uh, uh, Turkey backs the idea of either a no-fly zone or some sort of protected zone to save uh, Syrian civilians um, along the Turkish border. And I'm wondering if you could uh, sort of expand on what the Turkish policy is on that and also explain any roadblocks or obstacles that the United States may be presenting in the 
Division uh, for Protecting Civilians. Can you repeat the last part of your question, the obstacles in the United States? The obstacles that the United States might present uh, to Turkey in uh, implementing this type of protected area. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Pat. Um, just, just pass the mic to the gentleman there, and then we'll take the two together. Uh, Karen Israel, Embassy of Armenia. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Foreign Minister, for your uh, address. Uh, given your uh, uh, extensive uh, experience in the European affairs, in the, your tenure at the Council of Europe's Parliamentary Assembly, uh, I just wonder if you can comment uh, on the fact that on April 15, 2015, the European Parliament uh, has adopted the resolution uh, which officially recognizes uh, the tragic events that have uh, faced the Armenians during the Ottoman Empire uh, as a genocide and where it, uh, uh, where it calls upon the European Council and the European Commission and Turkey as well to recognize the events as the genocide and to come to terms to your, with your past and uh, thus pave a way for a genuine reconciliation between Turkish and Armenian people. Thank you very much. Thank you for the questions. Uh, before I answer this question, I forgot to respond to my Somalian uh, friend. Thank you very much for the gift, first of all. And we are doing our best uh, to support uh, Somalian people. And we just built a hospital with 200 beds, and Turkey is running this hospital now. But hopefully in uh, five years' time, we will hand over to the Somalian that we are training them right now, uh, the doctors and the staff, and then hopefully they will be able to run that hospital. And we also build hospitals in other African countries, including Sudan, and serving not only uh, those people of those, those countries, but citizens of other African countries. And we are developing, we are supporting the development projects in almost all African uh, countries and we will continue. And thank you very much uh, for the uh, gift once again. Regarding the safe zone, Turkey proposed safe zone with, uh, with air cover or no fly zone. We know the realities of the uh, region very well. And as I mentioned in my introductory speech, we warned our allies and the other uh, countries in the coalition right now about the possible developments in Syria and also in Iraq. Unfortunately, uh, our recommendations or advices were not taken into account. Now, including United States, our friends regret that they didn't. Now we are proposing a uh, uh, safe zone because it's a must in Syria. First of all, we need safe areas. Now we are implementing the uh, train and equip program. And we uh, need safe zones in uh, Syria for the success of uh, this uh, program on in the ground. Secondly, uh, you know how many uh, refugees uh, living in the neighboring countries, Syrian refugees, uh, including Turkey? More than five, uh, four million. And you know how many IDPs in Syria? More than 8 million. And who is helping these vulnerable people? Turkey is doing its best, and we are supplying whatever they need, particularly in the camps. Now, uh, around 240,000 of them living in the 25 camps that we built. Another 38,000 living in the camps, three camps that we built in northern Iraq. And, uh, and we are supplying education, healthcare and food and everything. Now the budget is, budget of, budget of uh, World uh, Food Organization is run out. And we have to uh, support those vulnerable people living in Turkey, not only in the camps, but in, in all over the Turkey. But these people deserve better. Can we give proper education to the children? There are 500,000 Syrians in Turkey at the age of education and we have been able to give education to only 140,000 of them. What, happened, what will happen to another 360,000 uh, Syrian children? And we have more than uh, 100,000 newly born babies in, uh, Syrian babies in, in Turkey. So what I mean, this zone is also essential to relocate all these refugees and also IDPs. The, the, our guests in Turkey living in better condition than the ones living in other neighboring countries. 
I'm not blaming them because uh, they are also doing best, but uh, they cannot afford, actually, particularly Lebanon and Jordan. So we need to relocate these people in this safe zone with all the infrastructure that they need, school, hospitals, and whatever they need. So that's why we propose this safe zone. And the main uh, problem is here, how as the coalition is going to enhance the security for this safe zone, whether it should be supported by uh, uh, no-fly zone or air cover. Obviously, we think uh, different here with United States, or United States have different uh, proposals or uh, different ideas of this uh, safe zone and no-fly zone. But if we agree, we, will, we should together, do together, we should implement uh, together with United States. So we are not, uh, Turkey is not uh, insisting to do, to enhance the uh, safe zone or no-fly zone uh, as its own self. So, uh, but unfortunately, uh, few uh, uh, coalition members like France gave full support, but other uh, the, uh, core countries, the core members of the uh, coalition has uh, or have different uh, opinion on this uh, safe zone. But uh, we will continue uh, try to uh, convince our uh, allies. And regarding the Armenian issue and the Europe decision of the European Parliament, it's a uh, Euro a skeptic party, I think, uh, made this proposal. It doesn't matter who did, but this uh, resolution is not legally binding, and it's not binding. And uh, to our mind, the politicians, national parliaments, and the European parliaments or international uh, or parliamentary assemblies of international organizations shouldn't give such decision. We shouldn't politicize this issue. And I know as politician, it is not that easy to uh, decide about the history. I also uh, wrote a lot of reports for the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe on missing persons in the Balkans and, and so on. And I uh, wrote one of the most difficult reports for the Parliamentary Assembly on mass famine. Mass famine in 1932 and 33, or Holodomor or Golodomor. Uh, so it was not an easy job. And I visited uh, Kazakhstan, Russia, Caucasus is part of Russia, Ukraine, and also Belarus for uh, fact-finding uh, visit. And I met everybody. And you, then president of Ukraine, Yushchenko, was obviously for genocide. And he arranged a group of uh, scientists uh, to meet me. And during the meeting, at, at the end of the meeting, 40% uh, of this, uh, those scientists Historians told me that it was a genocide. And 30% of them said, uh, no, it was not genocide. And another 30% said, we don't have idea or I don't have idea. So as a politician, how can I decide whether it was or it was not a genocide? At, in my report, I said crime against humanity for uh, mass famine in 1932 and uh, 33. Well, who is going to decide? whether it was a genocide or not. Obviously, uh, genocide is not a generic term. It's a legal term. And to our mind, historians should also decide. That's why we propose Armenia to set, up a joint, uh, to set up a joint committee of historians and scientists. And we should open, we propose to open the archives. And this uh, joint committee shouldn't be limited with Armenian and Turkish scientists and the scientists, historians from third countries uh, could also participate. And the third countries should also open the uh, archives. And we committed in our uh, letter, in the letter of Pre uh, Prime Minister Erdogan, uh, we committed to accept the outcome of this study. So what else do you expect from Turkey? Why don't we set up this joint committee of historians? Let them study, let open the archive, and we will accept the outcome. Otherwise, it's easy to convince parliamentarians, 
to sign the resolution or to adopt the resolution, but it doesn't help to solve the problem. It didn't. In the past, the national parliaments of some countries in Europe, in Latin America, adopted such resolutions, but it didn't help. I think Turkey and Armenia and Turkish and Armenian people should solve this issue uh, together. Thank you. Thank you, thanks very much. Uh, Abdul Rahim Fuqara from uh, Al Jazeera. You have uh, peace and stability in Europe, and then you have chaos in the Middle East. Uh, do you ever regret having invested so much uh, effort and attention in your Middle East policy? And are you ever concerned that Bashar al-Assad, if he stays uh, uh, much longer in power, is going to uh, suck Turkey into the vortex of Middle Eastern chaos? Thank you. Thank you very much. It's true that despite the, all the challenges that European societies have been facing, like uh, economic and financial crisis, migration issues, and integration, and also international uh, crime and uh, organized crime and ter uh, international terrorism, climate change, you can, I can name more. Despite all these challenges, the European continent is still the most stable and most developed and most democratic uh, continent. And we never regret uh, for investing uh, in Middle East. You, you cannot always uh, succeed, but we should do our best to support uh, the Middle Eastern people. And we should support uh, the countries uh, suffering from all this uh, crisis. That's why we give full support to uh, the new uh, Iraqi government, inclusive uh, government. And uh, regarding uh, Syria, uh, yes, we have to eradicate the uh, bloody terrorist organization, Daesh. But meanwhile, we should also eradicate the root causes of the problem. Yesterday, there was no Daesh in the Middle East, in Iraq and Syria. There was Al-Qaeda. Uh, Daesh was emerged from Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Then they got support from uh, different circles and they moved to Syria, and they got a lot of support from uh, the regime. That's why they have these Russian, Chinese, and Serbian-made weapons in their hand. And then when they feel themselves strong enough, they went back to Iraq, they captured Mosul, and they also kept our um, uh, consular staff as hostage for 102 days. And at the end, we were able to bring them uh, through a smooth operation. That's another story. But uh, and in Mosul, uh, the Shia militias of Maliki, uh, around 70,000 of them left, uh, left Mosul. And they left all these heavy weapons behind. And Daesh got them. Tanks, artillery, and even missiles. And all these heavy weapons, American made one. Now Daesh has American and uh, Russian made weapons in their hands. And they advance in both Syria and uh, Iraq uh, with all this power. But if we don't eradicate the root causes, yesterday it was Al-Qaeda, then Al-Nusra, then Daesh, and tomorrow we don't know who is going to be emerged as terrorist organization. So the, the current situation and the regime is the fertile ground for the radicalization and terrorism in Syria. Therefore, Assad must go, and we cannot unite the people of Syria uh, around Assad anymore, because this regime is killing. As long as Assad stays, they will, co uh, they will continue killing people through the barrel bombs, through the chemical weapons, through the crawling gas and uh, air bombings. And Aleppo is a very strategic uh, town, and uh, around 2 million civilians uh, living uh, there. Therefore, we uh, never regret uh, for uh, where we stand for the Middle East. And uh, Turkish foreign policy is multidimensional one anyway, and uh, this uh, multidimensional and, uh, uh, and proactive policy is uh, complementary. They are not alternative to uh, the, each other. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I want to thank on behalf of everybody here, I want to thank Foreign Minister Shabashola for uh, your remarks and especially for your uh, taking all these questions and, and addressing them. Uh, wish you well on the rest of your uh, stay here, and please come back and join us again. Thank you very much. Thank you.